that's yeah. what we normally do. Yeah. Okay. Although there are a couple of places where I'm going to ask people to, you know, what is level of service and see if anybody oh, okay. has an answer. So, Great. just to make it a little more interactive. Yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay, everyone. Um, I think we'll start our seminar. This seminar for the students in the room is also known as USP 407507 or CE 407507. I think you guys who are enrolled in this know the drill by now. Um, Miad's passing around the sign-in sheet. Please sign in. Um, for anyone who's, well, we're not broadcasting yet, but there will be people watching on the web. Okay, great. And, and they may have questions, too. Um, my name is John Glebe, and I host this along with Dr. Bertini. And at other times of the year, Miguel Pigliosi and Jennifer Dill and um, Chris Monsier. So today, um, our guest will be uh, Salida Reynolds of Fair and Peers. Will talk to us about multimodal level of service and state of the practice. Is the signal okay? Good, you're live. Oh, great, and scary. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to turn it over to Salida and um, she will introduce herself. Okay, great. Uh, so happy to be here today. I don't know whether to be happy or sad for you that you're spending this beautiful lunch hour with me talking about multimodal level of service. I hope you get something out of it. Um, and would encourage you to ask as many questions as you have, um, maybe at the end. Um, I'm going to do a little self-introduction. The first thing you need to know about me is that I grew up on a street without sidewalks and bike lanes in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in American history from uh, Brown University, and I wanted to be either a copy editor or a museum curator because really I had no idea what I wanted to be. Um, I went out to the Bay Area, and in order to um, support myself, I had a, an unpaid internship with a guidebook company. Um, in order to support myself, I took a paid internship with the City of Oakland's Bicycle and Pedestrian Program. Um, at the end of the summer, uh, the guidebook company went under, um, which I think was karmic payback for not paying their interns. Um, but the City Oak offered me a full-time job. Uh, I had 20 hours a week with the bike program, and the other 20 hours a week I had to film myself. So I worked with the civil engineering guys, mapping storm drains and inlets, which was scintillating. Um, and I worked with I wrote press releases for the PR uh, department, and all at the same time I was helping to implement the city's bicycle master plan, which meant I needed to learn things about level of service, parking surveys, um, and how bicycles interact with traffic. Um, I wrote a, enough grants to fund my position full-time, uh, but at the end of three years, uh, I was the bicycle and pedestrian coordinator for the city. Um, I had gone as far as I could, so I, I wanted to work on a broader array of transportation projects, um, and I also wanted to work with more cities than just Oakland. Uh, so I went to work for a consulting firm called Fair and Peers. At that time, there were three of us in the San Francisco office. Uh, by the time I left, there were about 16 or 17 in that office. Fair & Peers is a company of about 250 planners and engineers um, with 12 offices throughout the West. Uh, we're about to open an office in downtown LA. I'm not sure if it'll be lucky or unlucky 13, we'll see. Um, but uh, moved up to the Pacific Northwest to our Seattle office last June uh, because we merged with a company there called Mirai. So we needed some help with the um, transition, sort of bringing them into uh, Fair & Peers. So that's a, a little bit about me. Um, I'm the president of the Association for Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. Um, if you're not a member, we have student rates. Um, please uh, talk to me afterwards. Um, I'm also on the TRB Pedestrian Committee and the ITE Ped Bike Council. Um, so I'm deeply involved with um, bicycle and pedestrian issues, both within Fair and Peers um, and sort of um, as much as I can on a national level, as much as they'll, they'll let me. So um, with that, uh, this is a little bit about uh, what we're going to talk about today. This is an outline of the presentation. 
We're going to talk about what, uh, where our existing level of service standards are now, how they work in practice, where they've gotten us as far as transportation infrastructure and analysis. We talk a little bit about what's going on at the national level with um, efforts to quantify level of service for all modes, for vehicles, uh, bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders. Talk about some other approaches. And what I really want to keep your attention on throughout the discussion is really um, what are our urban transportation problems that we're trying to solve? And what are the best tools to really get us to the answers that we want? Um, so I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about the problems with our existing approach to level of service. Um, and then I'm going to talk about multimodal LOS. But I, I want us to think critically about whether or not multimodal level of service is the best tool for us to really begin to get at some of the transportation challenges that we struggle with um, throughout, the, throughout the country. So we'll talk a little bit about where we are now. Um, and can anybody tell me what level of service is? Do any of you know the definition roughly of level of service? Yes. I might remind you that if you answer this question, you should um, push a button somewhere. On your desk, or I'll give you this mic. Okay. Do you want to give it a shot? Yeah. Uh, maybe it's. Uh, Performance measure. Mm -hmm. That's pr yes, it is for for whom? So it depends for right. It can be for riders or agencies mm -hmm. who provide service mm -hmm. or anyone. Right. So this is actually the the level of service definition in the highway capacity manual right now. So it is a quality measure describing vehicle operational conditions with speed and travel time. And a lot of times when we talk about level of service, we talk about it in terms of average driver delay. So we're really talking about how long you have to wait at a signal or through along a corridor and, and what your sort of um, general uh, delay is as you're moving through that space. So these are some quick uh, descriptions of level of service. Uh, level of service is assigned a grade level. It's just like it was in uh, high school, where level of service A is the best. Uh, level of service F is the worst. So you'll see here in this image on the right, this is a depiction of sort of level of service A or B conditions. So you see there's not a lot of delay for drivers, not a lot of queuing. Drivers are able to move through that corridor um, at their leisure. This is a level of service C or D, things getting a little more congested but still stable. So level of service D is considered somewhat optimal by traffic engineers because things are at a high density but they're still moving. Here's level of service E or F. Uh, these grades are used to define breakdown conditions where the capacity of the roadway really begins to fall apart uh, because not, there aren't as many drivers that can move through a given space um, in a given time. So that's sort of a, a primer on level of service. So how does it work in practice? Um, and here's, here's maybe the first issue I would put to you. Um, we spend a lot of time putting together plans. We put together modal plans, bike plans, ped plans, transit plans, uh, street plans, comprehensive plans, um, and specific plans. And, and in those plans, we describe sort of the, the transportation improvements that we'd like to see. So this pie chart uh, represents about $28 million in transportation improvements for a single development project in Alameda, California. Um, so you'll see that in the plan, uh, they've identified about 75% of that overall pie going to automobile improvements. 25% uh, going to transit, which includes some pedestrian improvements, sidewalks and transit shelters and things like that, and about 1% to bike improvements. Uh, not great, but um, I think this also shows that the incremental cost of bicycle improvements is relatively small. Um, that actually represents the construction of an entire network of bikeways, both on street and off street, a bike station, bike parking, and a lot of other things. So it's... it's um, it's not great, but it's pretty good. So this is what we had in the plan. 
We went and did an environmental impact report on the project, and we used the level of service standards that the city had laid out, and their level of service standard is level of service E. So they want to maintain that on all their intersections and roadways. This is uh, the, the improvements that came out of the environmental document. So you see what happened. Um, very quickly, all of those transit and bike improvements all but disappeared because we don't have any way of measuring the impacts to those modes by development. Currently, we don't. Um, and environmental documents are written a lot of times uh, with, the, with the sole intent of being bulletproof to avoid having a project get sued and perhaps stopped entirely. So the, the analysis tends to be really conservative. Um, and it's also the only thing with teeth. So this is what's actually more likely to get built. Um, and I would maybe ask to hold questions till the end. So um, this is, but this is just an illustration of what happens when we apply our current level of service standard. We really don't get, uh, we get a complete disconnect between what we've planned um, and what might actually get built. This is an illustration of a, this is an aerial photo taken down in the Sacramento region in California. What it shows is what happened when this particular agency decided to go from a threshold of level of service D or E to level of service C. So they were using D or E as their sort of threshold to identify impacts and come up with improvements and mitigation measures. They decided that was too much congestion. They wanted to go to level of service C. Um, represented there on the right and on the left in the dark black is the amount of asphalt they will be adding to that intersection in order to maintain level of service C conditions. Um, and I, I, I hope, I, and you can see up at the top there's a little bit of dirt um, showing what they're going to do there on that approach as well. So this should tell you a lot about what happens when we rely too heavily on level of service. Um, the pedestrian crossing distance on almost every single approach has more than doubled. Um, the, the bike lanes are not included in this project, so there, there's really no road space allocation for bikes. Um, there's no transit to speak of, um, not to mention the value of the land that's now being used for asphalt rather than for other land uses that could be more valuable. Um, and, and this type of approach is going to perpetuate congestion. Um, it's uh, something called induced travel, which I won't get too deeply into, um, but basically when you build more roadway, it gets used up. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the connection between level of service and climate change. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time. There's a tendency to get really caught up in some of the graphs I'm about to show. So I'm going to try and give you in a nutshell what they're communicating. Um, if you're interested in this information, it comes from a book called Growing Cooler about the connection between land use and climate change. So if you're more interested, um, you can get all kinds of details in the book. But basically, um, our greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, uh, which accounts for about 50% of the overall GHG, comes from three sources. Basically, the vehicle technology, um, the type of fuel, whether it's gas or ethanol or something else, and vehicle miles traveled, which is what VMT stands for. Uh, VMT is increasing. This is actually some, some plot lines from King County in uh, Washington. VMT is outstripping the growth in population uh, by more than two times. So, so we're really adding vehicle miles traveled at a much faster rate than we're adding population. Um, here, keep your eye on that blue sort of gray line there at the bottom. That is sort of, um, as said in California, Washington, and Oregon, basically our goal where we want to be um, with uh, carbon emissions and sort of how much of a reduction we want to see. That orange line is where we'll be if we sort of employ different legs of the stool. So this one shows what would happen if we increase the um, CAFE standards and we got fuel economy up to 35 miles uh, a gallon, holding VMT constant. So we can get pretty, we can do pretty well if we can just increase our fuel efficiency. However, when we add projected VMT growth, that fuel efficiency benefit is completely wiped out. Um, so we, we think that that's, that's probably not enough. Um, even if we increase our fuel efficiency to 50 miles per gallon, 
Uh, by 2030, it's still just not quite enough. We have to do something about VMT in order to really get to where we want to be um, from a carbon emissions standpoint. So we don't have to go, we don't have that far to go. We don't need to, to hold VMT constant necessarily. If we were even to be able to reduce it by 15% off the projections, we would get pretty close to our emissions target. So this isn't something that's out of reach. It's something that's worth doing. And we need to start thinking about what barriers are in the way to, in, to decreasing vehicle miles traveled. This is a little bit of information about the connection between speed and emissions. You'll see that uh, the average vehicle speed is low on the left and gets higher as you move to the right. Um, the levels of, relative levels of service are shown here across the top. And you'll see that emissions really go down as soon as you get to levels of service A and B. This curve looks very different for a hybrid vehicle because as you probably know, when you stop a hybrid vehicle, it shuts off and you're not, you're not creating any more emissions. Um, but what this is a proxy for or sort of is, is hard to tease out is that this is really about how many stops the vehicle has to make. So the other piece of this puzzle is that we need to, to reduce those stops and manage vehicle flow through ITS pricing and some other operational improvements. Um, but how do we reduce VMT? Well, well, it's really about pulling all of these levers. So it's about increasing the density of land use. It's really about um, getting a mix of uses close together, um, creating a design where people, it's easy for bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders to get around, having regional destinations um, sort of at the hub of development, and really getting um, distance to transit as, as low as you possibly can. When we pull any of those levers, and, and any time we sort of um, pull a couple of them together, we begin to see real improvements in VMT. So anywhere from 1 to 17 percent with density, um, if you were to double it, uh, the same with diversity, and, and des destinations is the one that has the single biggest impact. This is all based on um, some research that was done uh, with the Environmental Protection Agency and looking at travel diary data from a bunch of different cities. Um, and what we found is that infill development um, has a much lower vehicle trip generation than suburban development. It's not a surprise, but this is the first time it's actually been documented. You can see that mixed use, transit oriented development, and infill development are between 30 and 45 percent lower than ITE trip generation rates. So, um, and by the way, there'll be a new um, appendix to the ITE trip generation handbook that will have a mixed use trip generation uh, by the end of the year. So, um, how this relates to level of service is that um, if our goal is to reduce VMT, and by reducing VMT, we really need to get people located in higher density developments that are in infill locations or near transit stops. Our, levels of, uh, our current level of service standard really unduly burdens these developments because they're, already, they're in already sensitive and congested areas. And so as soon as they load two trips onto the system, they end up having an impact um, and being on the hook for uh, big transportation improvements, uh, which they might not be able to fund. So level of service gets in the way of us really getting to where we want to be from VMT. So level of service and speed. Anybody want to hazard a guess about what the connection is between level of service and speed? If you want to produce a good level of service what for vehicles, what are you trying to do to the sort of speed? Yes. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, an unintended consequence of that is um, a real spike in the severity of collisions. Speed is the number one cause for all collisions, but when you begin to look at some of the most vulnerable roadway users, um, speed has a, a huge, is a huge difference maker in whether or not a pedestrian or cyclist is able to walk away uh, from a collision. Um, you'll see that when you get up into the higher um, miles per hour here, the incidence of fatality and injury just grows exponentially. So as we're trying to hold ourselves to a really good automobile level of service, perhaps an unintended consequence is that we are ending up with 
um, collisions that are far more severe um, than they need to be. So the other point here is that we are running out of space and we're running out of money to build our transportation improvements. Um, and when we look at just looking at uh, one roadway user, um, we're looking at something that requires a lot of space. Um, here's how much, uh, how many people you're fitting on the road if you're if you're trying to to fill it with uh, automobiles. Here's what it looks like if you tried to do the same thing with bicyclists and pedestrians. And here's what it looks like if you put those same folks onto a bus. So when we think about limited resources and how to use them most effectively, um, our goal should not be to continue to add cars because that's really not an efficient use of the limited asphalt that we have. So this is sort of a traditional transportation planning process. Um, you develop your land use uh, within your, the context of your general or comprehensive plan. And then you engage in sort of threshold-based transportation planning where you try and achieve a certain level of service for the number of trips generated by your land uses. And then you come up with this great robust list of transportation improvements that you would love to see to maintain your, your level of service. And it costs you, you know, $10 billion and it's going to take you over a century to build. Um, and it probably doesn't address any other mode other than automobiles. Um, particularly if you take a threshold-based approach. So I want you to keep this little flow chart in mind. Uh, we're going to come back to it at the end um, and think about a different way of doing this um, that might be more reflective of, of community values. So uh, why should multimodal level of service be considered? Uh, first of all, we didn't have tools for a long time. We didn't, there was no state of the practice. There wasn't anything that anybody was using that had been validated on a national level. Um, that's not the case anymore. There was a, a huge report, um, NCHRP report, which we'll talk about, that came out last year that's feeding into a new, two new chapters in the Highway Capacity Manual about how to calculate both intersection and corridor level of service for all modes. So that's great. We have this new tool. Uh, it's been, we'll talk a little bit about how they came, how they arrived at their tool. Um, and you might be able to implement modal plans sooner with the development mitigation actions. So the other issue here is that we haven't had a way to say, you know, what the thresholds are for impacts to all modes. So multimodal level of service might be a way to get us that answer. Um, this uh, multimodal, using multimodal level of service can get you closer to a more accurate picture about the deficiencies in your system. Um, and it could lead to allocations of resources for all modes. So that's why we, we want to get to a more, a more multimodal level of service. Um, but keep in mind some of the issues that I raised earlier on, um, particularly the disconnect between what we planned and what we build um, as we're talking about whether or not multimodal level of service might really help us with that. So. Um, NCHRP uh, 3-70, that's the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, um, and the draft 2010 HCM. If you're really interested, um, the intersection level service chapter is draft. It's out for review. They're looking for comments by May 31st. Um, it's a monster, so if you're having trouble sleeping at night, um, I'd recommend you take a, take a pass through and um, give it some critical thought. Uh, City of Charlotte, North Carolina, has been using a, a multimodal level of service that addresses bikes, peds, and transit for a while. Um, their measure really incorporates some urban design uh, um, elements that some of the others do not. So for that reason, I think it's a good one. Um, Gainesville, Florida, was one of the originators of uh, bike and ped level of service probably 10 or 11 years ago. Um, and that their model is actually the foundation for what's going into the Highway Capacity Manual. Fort Collins, Colorado, we'll talk about a little bit. An interesting thing about their model is that it gets at network connectivity or system completion. So do you really have a network of bike lanes and sidewalks, or do you just have a couple of corridors here and there um, that may not really serve trips? And then we're going to talk about uh, person delay and finally a couple of um, throw out the manuals approaches. A couple of places where um, they're considering getting rid of level of service altogether, uh, which is a pretty revolutionary idea, um, but we're talking about San Francisco, California, and Redmond, Washington. So a couple of places that are really at the um, 
leading, some might say bleeding edge of this, um, and really interested in getting to a new um, sort of analysis paradigm. So this is a level of service flowchart from NCHR P3-70. The only thing I want you to take away from this is that is the level of complexity and the fact that you've now increased the amount of data that you have to collect, the amount of analysis that you have to do uh, four times over. And in an era of limited resources and cities and developers struggling to really come up with money to do analysis, uh, we need to think carefully about whether or not this is going to get us a, a, a really a, a valuable answer or what it's going to tell us, how we might use it. So you'll see um, there's bike level of service um, and the, the sort of interrelation between pedestrian and transit level of service. Bike level of service really relates um, to all of them. So they're trying to sort of um, show the interconnectedness of this. In the existing version of the Highway Capacity Manual, there are level of service calculations for bikes and peds. They are based on delay, so they're very much in the same paradigm as vehicle level of service. And I want you to think about the last time as a, as a bicyclist or a pedestrian you really cared about delay or delay was really a factor for you. Um, they, they get at sort of how many pedestrians per square foot there are on the sidewalk um, and sort of how long those pedestrians are waiting at a signal. Um, and it wasn't a very useful answer. So that's why it's become more complex. And we'll talk a little bit about the factors that feed into some of those. So here's the pedestrian level of source calculation. The bike and ped level of service uh, equations are really trying to quantify the experience of walking along a roadway or walking along a corridor. They're not about delay. It's not about safety. Um, it's just about how it feels as you're walking along the sidewalk. So the key inputs into this are buffering from traffic. So for instance, whether or not there is a, a landscape strip, a parking lane, the volume and speed of the traffic in the outside lane. Um, and in some of them, uh, there's a factor in there for complexity of crossing. So this is what level service A looks like in the pedestrian level service model. Here's what C or D might look like. You can see the buffering from traffic has all but disappeared. And here's the NF, where you just don't have anywhere to walk. The bike level of service is somewhat similar. It really um, has to do with whether or not you have a dedicated space to ride. Um, one of the biggest, uh, single biggest factor that can sort of um, throw the ped level of service besides uh, vehicle volume is frequency of street trees. So um, that's something to just keep in mind. For bike level of service, it's percentage of heavy truck traffic. Um, and you know if you've ever been on a bike, the crosswinds you get when a big truck passes you um, is pretty uncomfortable. So, so here's a bike level of service. Again, a lot of the same inputs, um, volume and speed in the outside lane, um, buffering from traffic. Here's C or D where there's less buffering and more traffic. And here's E and F where you pretty much have no place to ride. Um, so there you go. Bus level of service has to do with headways and frequency. So there's A, B, uh, C, D, E, and F. This is a spaghetti diagram of um, the, across the top is all the data you'd need to collect. And across the bottom is the outputs of these spreadsheets that are going to be in the, the highway capacity manual. Um, and you can see the interrelationship between signal timing, speed limits, the, the um, sort of condition of the pavement, the bus headways, all of these things um, interrelate and how they sort of um, come together. But again, what I want you to take away from this is that it, it becomes incredibly complex. Um, it's not transparent or really predictable. So we wanted to take a look at the actual HCM uh, or the NCHRP equations and figure out just how accurate they were. The way that they gathered their data is they had about 148 people sit in uh, a room and watch film of a, a sidewalk. So they didn't actually have people go out and walk the sidewalk and fill out a survey. They were sitting in a room and they filled out the survey as they were watching a video of somebody walking along that corridor. The same is true for bikes. So we wanted to send people out in the field and find out just how accurate or useful um, that, that was. So the, on the left are all the locations. This is actually from our Walnut Creek office. 
um, but we're going to be we're going to end up doing this sort of company wide. So we'll probably have a similar number of observations. And uh, what we asked is uh, generally the survey that we asked people to fill out. We wanted them to tell us just generally what their satisfaction was as they were walking uh, along the walking audit. Uh, facility service, so focusing on things within the right of way that are within sort of a, a, a local agency's control. Um, and then environment. So what we really wanted to get at, which, which um, the NCHRP report does not, is what's happening on the land use side as you're walking along the corridor and does it matter? Um, and so this is what we found. And you see here, this is, we've separated the segments and the crossings. That's something important to remember. In the NCHRP report, they put those two things together. And we'll talk about the impact of that. Um, but here you'll see that generally, when we ask people about their satisfaction, we were within one letter grade of what the NCHRP model said about those same segments. So we took their spreadsheet, we entered the data, we got that result, and then we sent people out into the field, they filled out their survey, um, and these were the results. Um, so you can see there that, that we're, pretty, we're pretty close. So we felt pretty good about um, that, that connection. But one thing you might notice about this is that it's really difficult to get a level of service A. It's also difficult to get a level of service E or F. And these streets in Walnut Creek are not small streets. They are big expressways. Um, they have car dealerships and Target stores um, on the land use side, frequent driveways. Um, so they're not what you would consider uh, really lovely pedestrian environments, um, but you'll see that still people were reluctant for whatever reason to give really poor grades. Here's where we put segments and crossings into one equation, um, and you'll see we're 100% on with what the NCHRP report says. So what we felt is that um, what this does is mask a really good environment or a really poor environment. So it's not as useful um, because there are very few levels of service A's or F's to really understand where, where maybe people are uncomfortable and to get at that underlying question about why people walk and where they walk and why they want to walk. So this um, Christmas tree is meant to show you uh, what the satisfaction level of service frequency was. So the segments are here on the left. Um, and for each segment, we're showing how many people gave it an A, B, C, D, E, or F. So again, really hard to get an A or an F. Wide variation among respondents for any given survey. And one interesting thing that we found is that people who take transit to work every day were much harder on these segments than people who drove to work every day. Now, I don't know if you can take anything away from that at face value, but it does get at maybe some underlying cultural issues that are really hard to nail down in a survey uh, like this, um, so that people who take transit every day might be a proxy for something else. It could be that it could be younger people, it could be more liberal people, it could be people with families or without families. We're not sure. Um, but this is kind of, of what we found uh, to be true. We also had, um, because we're a little bit self-selecting and we've got a bunch of wonky planners and engineers out doing this survey, we also asked folks from our corporate office to go out and do it. And they were much easier on all of these segments than any of the planners or engineers. Um, so we saw much better grades for the same, the same segment. So some interesting things coming out of that effort. So here's just a, a little summary of, of what I just said. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a project where I actually used bike level of service on a citywide basis. So about eight or nine years ago, I did a bike plan for the city of Santa Clara in California. It's right near San Jose. And as part of that effort, they wanted to put together a bike suitability map. So they wanted to tell people where it's appropriate to ride if you're an inexperienced rider or, or a very ex an advanced rider. Um, and so they, they went out and gathered all of this data for all of their city streets. Things like parking occupancy, percentage of heavy, heavy truck traffic, um, condition of pavement, width of the outside lane, extremely data intensive um, and a really expensive effort. So I want to focus a little bit on one street, Great America Parkway. So you'll see it here shown, um, sort of a close up. It's basically right here on the map. And you'll see that it got a bike level of service A. 
Great. So it should be appropriate for all riders. Um, everybody should be comfortable on that street. Um, it serves Great America. It's got a lot of destinations. Um, there's probably a lot of latent demand to bike on that street. But this is what Great America Parkway looks like. It is a six to eight lane nightmare. It carries 45,000 vehicles a day. The posted speed is 45 miles an hour. You'll see there are on ramps, off ramps, axel lanes, decel lanes. It's a really challenging environment for bicyclists. The reason why it showed up as level of service A is because it had an eight foot wide shoulder. Um, so I would ask you if you would feel comfortable having your grandparents or your children ride this street. Um, and so, you know, quite clearly we couldn't give it anything but a, a big red line in our bike suitability map. Um, and we actually did end up designing bike lanes along this street, which is another presentation in and of itself um, about all of those unique design challenges. But but that's one of the issues with bike level of service. So say I was going to build, uh, I'm a developer and I want to, you know, they want to reuse this parking lot and build some uh, mixed use, uh, you know, some mixed use type development right there. And the city says, all right, we're going to use bike level of service to figure out what you need to do to really improve things for bikes. We would run the level of service model and it would say we had level of service A. And you really don't need to do anything to improve conditions for bikes. So I would just say that I'm, I'm still not sure, you know, in the bike plan we had put a recommended bike lane here. Again, the bike level of service model wouldn't get you to that answer. Um, we also used, we wanted to use bike level of service to actually prioritize improvements. So we wanted to take a look at what the conditions were now and what the bike level of service was under existing conditions, what it would be if we installed a bike lane and understand that delta between those two, the, the sort of incremental change. Um, and try and use that as one of the factors to prioritize improvements, but it really began to fall apart um, when we looked at, at cities throughout the street, <laughs> streets throughout the city. Um, here's an application of multimodal level service along a street, um, Oshkosh and First Street. Um, the actual level of service, sort of broken down by mode, for vehicles it's level of service D, transit E, bikes C, pedestrians D. So you could argue that the street doesn't really work for anyone. Um, but, but so you have this answer. Now you know what your level of service is for all users. Um, how, what's, what's the appropriate level of service? What do you want on these streets? This down here in the lower right is what you might have to do. You basically break down level of service by mode here. By land use, is it a main street or an industrial street, for instance? And then by sort of functional class, and come up with what's acceptable. So on a, an arterial main street, you want level of service A for pedestrians, for instance, whereas you're willing to tolerate level of service E for vehicles. So you can see it, it leads to some really sticky questions about how you want to apply it as a, as a city or a county. Here's the Fort Collins approach. What I like about this, and you'll see here across the top, the factors that they look at, um, they've got directness and continuity. Uh, for within a pedestrian district um, or a school walk area, for instance, how the street crossings feel, if there's visual interest and amenities and security, um, and they actually require all their developments to analyze these level of standards, service standards for all modes. So that's something Fort Collins has been doing. This is taking a traditional uh, delay approach, but actually you, looking at the number of users by mode. So um, this is for a study we did in Davis, California, which is one of the bike capitals of the world. Um, so here's what it is for vehicles, buses, pedestrians, bicyclists, and then uh, that's seconds of person delay, and then we sort of weighted it by the number of users by mode. Um, and here's what we came up with for an average. What this study found is that in order to decrease overall delay uh, for everyone, they needed to decrease the number, the amount of vehicle delay and pedestrian delay. So their solution was to construct, you can see it here sort of in the corner, an overpassing back, an overpass back here that goes over the roadway um, to basically take pedestrians and cyclists out of the flow of traffic entirely so that you wouldn't have to time the signal for them. Um, and I will tell you from experience that nobody is going to use that overpassing if they construct it um, and it's incredibly expensive. So. Um, I would say that that was, that was not the best 
approach. So I'm going to talk a little bit about auto trips generated. So this is something the uh, city of San Francisco is considering. This is the throw out the manuals approach. So forget about level of service. It's not getting us the answers we want. It's a hindrance to doing all the things that, that we want to do for climate change um, and, and safety. So we're going to try something different. So what they're proposing is that they take, as they are for development review, take the number of vehicle trips generated per day and require development to pay a per trip impact fee or fund actions that reduce new automobile trips. So this is a simplified version of the process. So you start out saying, will, it, will the project generate new trips? If it won't, you're fine. If it will, you have to estimate the, the vehicle trips generated or induced by the project. Um, and then determine the mitigation. So you, you're, you're paying into a fee that's a, a, a fund that's used to construct um, improvements for other modes. So San Francisco has a pedestrian plan and a bike plan and a transit first policy um, and they would like to fund those improvements um, and use sort of a general fund to deal with things holistically rather than getting a per intersection uh, improvements on an intersection by intersection basis. Um, so this is really um, the summary of why they, they're thinking of going to this approach. Um, and you'll see that in the area of sort of um, air quality, greenhouse gases, uh, traffic intrusion, and safety, they felt that automobile LOS um, did a worse job than uh, automobile trips generated in getting them to an answer that uh, made more sense. So um, interesting that they're one of the first ones to incorporate safety because of uh, we live in a pretty litigious world, um, agencies are really hesitant to uh, talk about safety at all in development impacts. Um, so this is an, an attempt to do that. I'm going to talk a little bit finally about the city of Redmond and Washington and what they're considering doing. So Washington has a concurrent growth management act and includes a concurrency ordinance. This is a typical development review process. Um, you get to this point where you ask whether or not it passes concurrency, and concurrency is a measure of whether or not you have facilities in place to deal with the demand um, that you're anticipating. Um, so if you do pass, it's a yes-no lever. It's a pretty blunt tool. Um, it doesn't have a lot of finesse to it. Um, if you pass the concurrency test, you go on, you do your SEPA review, which is their environmental impact uh, report, and then you pay mitigation fee. If not, you revise your proposal. Um, or your project gets shut down. I'll tell you that that right half of that flow chart never happens. Uh, most agencies in Washington set up their um, impact criteria so that development never fails concurrency. Um, so I think that's something that could be changing, uh, but that's, that's the way it works now. So the city of Redmond, um, the way concurrency often gets measured, it's on an intersection LOS basis, intersection by intersection. The city wanted to go to something totally different. They had just spent a ton of money on their transportation master plan. It's a great master plan. It has improvements. It has about seven chapters, improvements for all modes, really robust commute trip reduction program. Um, so they wanted to go to something that was a concurrency test that was more plan-based, that honored the planning that they had already done. Uh, they wanted it to be multimodal. So they didn't want it to just focus on one user. They wanted it to be citywide, and they wanted it to be simple and predictable. So what they decided to go to uh, was something uh, called mobility units of demand. So you see on the left here, these are all of the, the supplies. So here's what's in their transportation master plan. Up top is the land use change. That's the demand. Um, and then they, they basically feed it into a calculation um, uh, that's sort of based around person miles traveled. They figure out how many mobility units are left in the system, and then they decide whether or not that development passes concurrency. Um, and what they are trying to do is get to a measure that's more based around system completion. So how much of their auto, bike, ped, um, and transit system have they constructed that they said they were going to construct. Um, and here you'll see that when they actually go in and do the calculations, they're lagging behind for, uh, on bikes and peds. They're doing a pretty good job for transit and autos. So this is a way of trying to both measure their own ability to implement their TMP and, and really not allow more development than can be served 
um, by what they've got in place. Um, and this presumably, you know, if, if you want to be, if you want to develop in Redmond, um, and I'm sure I don't have to mention to you the single biggest developer in Redmond, Washington, um, if you want to continue to build uh, campus style offices or anything like that, um, you might need to help construct some of these, some of this infrastructure. So it helps the city get to a place where they can really negotiate with developers to build what they want and to build what they've planned. So this is the final slide here. This is the new transportation planning process where um, we're, really, we're really using a constraints-based transportation planning. So we're looking at what we have um, in terms of funding. We're looking at environmental impacts. We're looking at political will. And we're coming up with a transportation plan that's based around these ideas, that's based around what's available and what's feasible, rather than a level of service standard. So this is another uh, paradigm shift um, that I'm just pointing out, um, where you would just basically throw level of service out entirely um, and move to something um, that might get you uh, to build what you've planned, rather than um, building sort of things on an intersection by intersection basis. Um, that might not be in alignment with your community values. So, I think that's it. So I can take um, any questions you have about any of the material or about Farron Pierce or about working for the public sector versus the private sector um, or anything else that you're, you want to know. Yes. There's, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, to define and use LLS for transit, they don't have much conflict with paid and black LLS because they're based, they're more based on frequency and pay pay, so. Right, so there's, um, you know, there's, there's definitely an interplay between, I think, between pedestrian level of service and transit level of service because the transit trip uh, presumes that you're a pedestrian on either end, certainly, and you might be a bicyclist on either end. So there's definitely a connection between, you know, if, if as a city you want to provide a really robust transit network, um, you should also probably want to provide a really robust bike and ped network so people will take your buses um, and can get, can get to their destinations on both ends of their trip. Um, but it really is a service-based, um, a headway-based, you know, a number of buses per hour-based measurement um, I think that, that cities are not, and counties and states are not as likely to rely upon it, and they, they usually don't include very much about transit because they feel as though it's something that's out of their control. So a lot of times there are institutional barriers to getting transit improvements. So the city and the transit agency are two totally different entities, and the city is hesitant to tell a developer, you must provide you know, five buses an hour um, when they really development really has no control over service frequency, so that's one of some of the challenges around transit level service. Yes. Um, when evaluating the level of services for a certain street or highway, how often <coughs> are residents considered, and how important is that? Never. So um, collisions and safety are not incorporated into any of the level of service measures that I showed you. Um, and as that one slide pointed out, um, level of service and safety are often in conflict with one another. There's the hesitation to include safety in analysis because it raises a city's risk of being sued, basically, if they identify a place as unsafe. Um, but I think it's, you know, when you think about the word service, and we're talking about level and quality of service, I'm not sure you can talk about that without talking about safety. Um, but that's one that where um, there's actually going to be a highway safety manual that's going to be published hopefully in the next few years here. Um, and so there'll, there'll be some attempt to get at um, the answer to that question because nobody really feels comfortable talking about it um, in a really specific way. Yes? What's the general feedback from developers to the change away from um, just kind of a single mode level service? And, and in general, does it seem like well, I'll say that um, for San Francisco, for instance, where they basically thrown out level of service altogether, the only reason why they feel like that's a good approach is that they did a lot of education and stakeholder outreach with the development community during um, the writing of their automobile trips generated 
um, sort of handbook. I think developers really um, are interested in that bottom line. What they care about is how your approach affects what they're going to owe in terms of impact fees or taxes or other things. And so they're interested in keeping those costs down. Um, but interestingly, uh, what I've heard from them is that you know those automobile improvements, as you saw from that pie chart, they're the big ticket improvements. They're the ones that interchanges that cost millions of dollars. And if cities are willing to step away from that and, and put them on the hook to construct a bike lane or a bike path or a sidewalk, those are much smaller ticket items. So there's more openness to it, um, to really getting away from automobile level service, but it's because it relates to their sort of bottom line. Yes? It seems to me like a bike and pet uh, projects are obviously lumped together. Yeah. Do you find that to be true out when you're talking to different cities and agencies? And if so, how do you uh, correct that or how do you? Less and less. Uh, for a long time, uh, the state of California had, as part of their Streets and Highways Code, 11 elements that were required in a bike plan. And the reason why all the cities in California have bike plans and why they all read the same is because you had to have that in order to get access to a, this particular pot of money called the bicycle transportation account. It used to be called the bike lane account. Um, but there wasn't anything for pedestrians. And there aren't, there haven't historically been dedicated funding streams for pedestrians. So agencies haven't really been motivated to put together a separate modal plan for pedestrians. So I would say that it's starting to swing in the opposite direction, where there, it, there are sort of robust pedestrian plans and bike plans because people are asking for it and are interested in it. But I would argue that um, that promotes, uh, maybe you've heard of this term silo thinking, where we're just looking at pedestrians, or we're just looking at bikes, or we're just looking at transit. And really, we should be thinking about how all modes use any given street and how, what the trade-offs are among them. So the city of Ventura in California is putting together what's called a mobility master plan, which is a step away from doing a separate plan for each mode and doing a plan for everyone so that you think about every street comprehensively from the beginning because all of the needs are very different and we're understanding more and more about what the needs are. Um, but they can't, it, it, I don't think it's a great idea um, to necessarily separate them. Um, so I, but I don't, I mean, I, I think it's better than lumping bikes and peds together because they are very different. Um, but I don't want to move in a direction where they're not talking to each other. Yes? A, a question on, on uh, your experience in um, encouraging policy changes. A couple of policies that uh, come to mind here are policies about uh, reduction of transportation impact fees for either transit or mixed use uh, um, proximity. And another policy is, of course, a land use policy that is support, more supportive of mixed use versus uh, single use uh, development. Um, could you just, uh, first a two part question here, could you describe your experience in, in convincing communities to make policy changes? And then also, is this show on your website or? or on the website for this uh, transportation seminar program? I think the presentation is available to download afterwards. Yes, the um, yes. presentation is available to download. Yeah. So that was the easy part. Okay. Um, yeah. And the coolconnections.org is the website um, that has a lot, a ton of information about growing cooler, what's in the book, climate change, mixed use development, that whole connection. So I would say that's a, that's a really broad question. I would say that um, more, we're having more luck than you would think. And it's because the evidence is so compelling about the ability of mixed use um, and smart growth or infill development to reduce vehicle miles traveled and reliance on the automobile on the one hand. And on the other hand, these directives that are coming down now from the state of California, the state of Washington, the state of Oregon, I think we're going to see something nationally here in the next uh, year or so about um, climate change reduction and that transportation emissions are such a huge contributor. Um, and cities are really at a loss right now about how to meet those carbon emissions targets. Um, and so they are actually far more open to this kind of policy change than you would think in removing the obstacles to infill development. I'll also say that infill development is the only thing that's getting financed right now by the banks. Um, and so as much as we talk about, you know, it's the policies, it's really the economics in the market as well. Um, and what the market wants right now is, is transit-oriented development and uh, mixed-use type, type uh, for urban form, and that's what the banks are funding. 
So I think that um, the economics are going to drive it even even farther and faster um, than the policies will. Yes. Uh, with the uh, the constraint based transportation planning, how how do you go about identifying your need if you don't have some sort of level of service standard, or do you just have you use other performance measures when you're in that phase of the plan, and then they become less involved later on through development review? I guess that's the question. Right. So the way that you identify need for non-motorized modes um, is very different than how you might identify need for um, vehicles. And there's sort of a push and pull. Do you build the system that you want? So say your, your drive alone rate right now is 85%, but you want it to be 65%. So you want to have a 20% reduction in, in 30 years. So what system are you going to put in place that's going to really encourage that change? So there's sort of a stepping away from figuring out what the demand is right now or what that line would look like if it just continued to what you want it to be. Um, and then when you want to figure out where your needs are for non-motorized modes, um, there's a lot of research from the, uh, the Smart Growth Index um, that's done by Environmental Protection Agency about why people bicycle and walk and take transit and what really are the characteristics of those communities that have high rates of walking, biking, and, and bus riding. Um, and they really have to do with an interplay of land use and socioeconomic factors. So it really has almost nothing to do with the infrastructure um, or what you, what you have right now. It has way more to do with um, what you're, you know, what, what, where people want to go. Um, so that's, I would say that's, and there's a lot of latent demand modeling using GIS to come up with where your needs are for all modes that I think is a better, better tool than a constraints-based approach. Maybe one more question, or I don't know, how, do we have time for? We have time for one more. Okay. So maybe in the back, I think you saw your hand first. Okay. Uh, if I understand it correctly, the pedestrian LOS model included factors like uh, buffering from traffic, ADT, speed of vehicles, and things related to intersection design, whereas the bike model seemed a lot less robust and only really seemed to include whether or not there was space for bikes. So I guess uh, I have two questions. A, is, is that a correct understanding? And B, is there any discussion about including some more of those factors in the bike model? No, that's... That's, I'm, I misrepresented it if that's, if that's how it came across. The bike level service does include um, all of those same factors or many of the same factors as the PET LOS does. So speed and volume of traffic in the outside lane, buffering from traffic, pavement condition, and percentage of heavy vehicle traffic, um, as well as parking occupancy. So um, parking occupancy is a proxy for how much turnover you have because every time a car pulls in and out of a parking spot, you've created an, a sort of the number of conflicts for bikes has sort of blossomed. So that's another way of getting at that issue. So it, it is quite robust. Um, it does not, though, um, the bike level of service does not really include a very good tool for intersection level of service. And um, as you know, if you've ever been on a bike, that that's where a lot of the conflicts occur. Um, and the PET LOS is similar. If you wanted to get a PET LOS for an intersection, you'd need to do all four segments and crossings separately and then average them. So that's another way that the tool is, is sort of, I would I'd say it's still kind of beta. Um, it hasn't quite gotten to the level of sophistication that um, the automobile level of service is at. So with that, thanks a lot. It was great fun. <laughs> Thank you very much, Slita. Okay. Um, those of you in the class that have questions, um, if you do not get to ask, please write them down on a piece of paper and leave them here. Hi. Hi. Oh, it's not up to the city of Vancouver. Oh, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Hey, do you have a business card? Sure. Did yeah. Redmond actually, because I've been doing, we're looking at moving to our third generation concurrency. Uh-huh. We're uh -huh. looking at different ways to approach it. Has Redmond actually adopted theirs? Because the only multimodal I found was, I think, uh, Bellingham's got one, right? right? Uh, they're adopting it this summer. Okay. So they've just, they're finalizing.